Hey everybody, it's Ripley back again. We're going to talk a little bit about a topic called work, uh, which I like all of you to do regularly, particularly on mathematics. But this is more vis-a-vis uh, -vis the physics. So a lot of these things you're going to see in your physics courses, uh, perhaps natural sciences courses, things like that. So hopefully this will give you a leg up and give you a little bit better understanding when you're going through those processes. All right, the main topics that we're going to talk about today are springs. Whoops. We're going to talk about springs, which uses Hooke's law. Hooke's law. We're going to talk about uh, lifting problems lifting problems, and then we're going to talk about pumping problems. But before we do that, so pumping problems, before we do that, probs, we need to get some notation straight, okay? So work, there's two kinds of, of uh, units, right? We understand this. There's the imperial, which is garbage. Please, if you get an opportunity to vote it out, please do so. There's the imperial system, and then there's SI. All right, so we'll do this. This is SI. All right, now I'm going to assume that this is uh, Scientific Internacional or International Science Units, right, which we know is the metric system. <clears throat> so I'm going to assume that you know about meters and centimeters and feet and inches and all that good stuff. So we'll, we'll keep it really simple. When we talk about, when we talk about forces, and forces are going to be really important, uh, we'll explain why in just a sec. Um, for the imperial system, we have just pounds, okay? Just pounds. That's all you get. A pound is a is a force. In SI, we have we have uh, newtons, which is equal to a kilogram meter per second squared, right? And the reason that is is we know that force is mass times acceleration. F equals F, F equals ma. In pounds, the acceleration of gravity is always is already part of it. It's it's baked in, as it were. Okay. In um, when we're talking about work, and we know that work is force times distance, which we'll just call, we'll just write it out, distance. We have two things. We have joules, which is a kilogram, whoops, equals a kilogram meter squared per second squared, right? And for uh, uh, imperial system, we have what's called a foot pound. Now you may say, Ripley, a foot pound is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Yeah, but if you think about what a joule is, it's just a newton meter, right? I just tack one more meter on there. All right, so you got to be really careful. Um, another thing that you might want to know about is density of water. Density of water. All right, and usually densities in science are denoted by a lowercase rho. Okay, it looks like a P, kind of, without, without the little antenna sticking out of the top. Um, let's see, density of water in SI is 1,000. Now, remember, density is mass per unit of volume, so this would be kilograms per meters cubed. And for the imperial, it's 62.5. Look at that. How arbitrary, right? Uh, this is, what is this, pounds per cubic feet. Okay? So that gives us all of the information to start with. All right? We've got our units that we're going to be playing with. We've got work. We've got everything. All right. So let's start with the spring. All right? So I got myself a spring. La, 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 la. And I'm going to stretch that spring. I know that they don't stretch in a linear manner, but hush. All right, I'm going to stretch that string, uh, uh, that spring, a certain distance. All right, let's say, for example, that I have a spring that starts at. Let's go. Let's keep it sim simple. This is about. No, it's not even close. But let's call it 10 centimeters. Yeah, maybe it's, it's close, right? Four inches long, 10 centimeters. That's about what it is. All right, and I'm going to take that spring and I'm going to stretch it three centimeters. All right. Now we got to be really careful because we have to understand the difference between force and work. If I just walk into the problem and I'm sitting there and I'm, and I'm if somebody's pull, taken this 10 centimeter spring and stretched it three centimeters, right, past its natural length, think about it that way, it, and they're just standing there holding it, they are doing no work. Why are they doing no work? Because no distance is being used. Okay. In other words, I'm not stretching. The, I'm not applying my force through a distance. I'm simply holding it there. The question of work is how much work is done stretching from its natural length of 10 centimeters to three centimeters past its natural length, right? Well, we've got some information here. One thing that we do know is Hooke's law. Well, hopefully we know it. If you don't, you're about to. Hooke's law simply says that the amount of force required to stretch 
to hold a string stretched at a certain distance from its natural length is simply proportional to the distance away from its natural length it's being it's being held. So there's some arbitrary constant depending on the strength of the spring. The spring in the shocks of your vehicle is going to have a huge constant versus, you know, the little spring that you pull out of your ballpoint pen is going to have a tiny little constant. All right? Pretty simple. Hooke's Law just says force is proportional to the distance <coughs> that it stretched past its natural length. All right. Now, here's where things get interesting. Because you can probably kind of see where this goes. And this idea of adding up of increment, adding up a little bunch of works <coughs> is, excuse me, is probably going to lend really nicely to concepts like integrals. All right, so here's the way that this works when we do this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to set up an F sub I, all right, and then I'm going to set up a W sub I, all right, so here's what I'm saying. I'm going to take, I need a better color, let's do purple. I'm going to figure out the total work that it takes to stretch a 10 centimeter spring three centimeters past its natural length. All right, and you may just say, well, why don't I just take the thing with the three and then it doesn't work that way. All right, here's how it works. It's kind of neat. All right, what I have is I have a distance through which I'm stretching, which I'm going to call this thing x sub i. Now, if this distance is x sub i, by now you probably realize in all of our studies with volumes and all that good stuff that this is going to be delta x. Now, we know by Hooke's law that f is equal to k times x, or force is proportional to distance, right? So what role does this delta x play in a spring problem? Well, if f, f of x, excuse me, f sub i is simply going to be k, whoops, k times x sub i, right? In other words, if I were to just hold it x sub i, a distance of x sub i centimeters from the original length, the natural length of the spring, that would be the f sub i. So what role does this delta x play? Well, what it says is I'm stretching the spring through delta x. It gives me a distance. And when I have distance, oh, guess what I have? I have work. So my work, my w sub i, is going to be this arbitrary constant k times x sub i times delta x, right? Nothing to it. Now, I've just figured out how much work it takes to stretch it through this x sub ith distance from its natural length. If I want the overall work, this should be a pretty easy problem, right? I'm just going to take the integral of kx dx, which is kx squared halves, and then let's say from a to b. Now, we'll deal with these a's and b's here in just a sec. And this is from A to B, and I'm done. Smiley face, happy, happy. Now you may say, Ripley, I learned it in physics, and now you just taught me it. Can I just go straight to the kx squared over 2? No. The most important part of, of these topics is actually the setup. The integral itself is easy. That's the cool thing about these types of problems, is the setup is the hard part. The integral is the easy part. So you should be able to blast through it pretty quickly. Now, let's take, let's take my 10, 10 centimeter, uh, uh, 10 cent, let's see. 10 centimeter spring, I gotta orient myself here. And let's, just for giggles, I know that Newton's force is a kilogram meter per second squared, right? So K, the unit on K, since X is, think about this, this is always gonna be in meters. Since X is in meters, then K has, the units on it have to be kilograms per second squared, right? To be able to make a force, a Newton, right? These are the units for force. And Newton's law tells me I got a force. Right, easy enough. So let's say that I don't know. Let's let's call it eight. I just need an arbitrary number. Eight. So I'm going to figure out the exact amount of work that it takes for me to stretch a 10 centimeter spring through three centimeters past its natural length. Well, I've already got this guy set up. I'm already set. So all I have to do now is deal with where the action is taking place. Now this can be a little bit tricky, and this is why I don't want you launching immediately into the kx squared halves, because you might miss something. Now think about this. Where am I integrating from and to? I know this is going to be 8x, dx. That's the easy part. But where am I integrating from to, to from and to? Well, it's 10 centimeters long. It requires no work and no force to have it sit there 10 centimeters long. We don't start doing any work until we start pulling through three centimeters. Wait, centimeters? Wait, I got meters and centimeters. Oh, Ripley, you so tricky. You're right. 
Remember, centimeters are not meters, so everything needs to be in terms of meters. So what I'm doing, I'm, I'm starting with zero work. I'm not doing any work when, this, when the spring is just sitting there naturally. So I start at zero. And where do I finish? Well, three centimeters is 0 .03 meters, and I'm done. You say, but Ripley, but Ripley, you didn't use the 10 centimeters. You're right, I didn't. I don't have to. In fact, it should be obvious that given this spring constant, it does not matter how long this spring is if I'm stretching it through three centimeters. Pretty easy. And this just becomes, what does this become? 4x from 0 to 0.03, which becomes 0.12 joules. Right? Joules. I'm done. Not to it. Hey, that's pretty. Whoa! What was that? Hey, stop it. Get away from there. Okay. Um, but it's a 0.12 joules, right? Easy. Nothing to it. Now, what I want to emphasize here, because this is going to change in just a little bit, but nothing too crazy, all right? What I want to emphasize is that this delta x, what the delta x does in this equation is it does the work. It creates the work. The force is here. The work is here, and it's created by that addition of a delta x. Now, with that same idea, we're going to do a lifting problem, all right? Let's, do, let's keep this super simple. We're going to do a 50 meter Excuse me. We're going to do a 50 meter rope weighing weighing up to, uh, let's go 150 kilograms. Okay? Um, is hanging is hanging hanging over the edge of a building. So it's dangling all the way down. The building, let's assume that the building is taller than 50 meters. All right, over the edge of a building. Okay, so we've got our building. Here's my building. Here's my rope. And this thing's 50 meters and it's woohoo. Okay, it's dangling right there. So this whole distance right here is 50 meters. All right, and what I want to know is how much work, how much work is done lifting the rope the rope, uh, let's go 35 meters, meters, all right? Now you may say, well, why can't I just multiply? I, got, I lifted up 35 and everything's, everything's good and I just multiply that distance and I, oh wait, but the mass of the rope changes as this thing moves up, doesn't it? The mass of the rope goes, I, I'm having to lift less the more that I've lifted. Right? There's less rope to lift. Now, I'm going to show you how to do this, and it's kind of interesting. And the cool thing about this is that, I got a red one, the cool thing about it is the delta x behaves exactly the same way in this type of lifting problem as it did in the spring problem. So watch. What I'm going to do is, let's, let's, I'm going to put a little dot at the end of this rope. And let's say that we have lifted that dot through some distance, which I'll call x sub i, which is a little bit counterintuitive, right? Because we're not used to seeing vertical distances represented by x's. That's all right. We'll get through it. Now, if it, had, if it has gone up through x sub i, let's draw ourselves a little slice of action because that tells us that this is going to be delta x. And you can probably see that this delta x is creating the work again. All right. That said, this, this type of problem can be remarkably complicated and confusing if you're not thinking about it. Here's the way I do it, all right? What I need to know first is I need to know the mass of the system after it's been lifted up x sub i. So the mass of the system, which I'm calling m sub i. From there, it's pretty easy to go to the force of the system after the ith interval, right? Because mass to force just multiplied by the acceleration of gravity, right? Because that's technically that's the only force that we're concerning ourselves with. Now you may be, Ripley, well, what if it's swinging back and forth? That's changing. Well, I understand that, but let's keep it simple. And then from there, we just go W sub i. Now, I already told you that the delta x creates the work. So basically, once I've got the mass, all I got to do is multiply by 9 by 8, 9.8, then all I got to do is multiply by, <clears throat> excuse me, then all I got to do is multiply by delta x and I'm done. Okay, so here's the tricky part. What is the mass of the system? Well, the mass, let's put it over here parenthetically. We're going to, we know it's in kilograms, right? I've got a 50 meter rope that weighs 150 kilograms. Well, when it's moved up x sub i, it no longer weighs 
150 kilograms. So the weight, the mass of the rope is totally dependent on X sub I, isn't it? So if we think about this rope, do you agree that this is going to be 150 kilograms divided by 5 meters, which gives me kilograms per meter, but I don't want kilograms per meter. I want kilograms. So what should I do? Oh, that's easy. I multiply through by X sub I, don't I? True, because look at the units. So gone, gone. Oh, wait a sec. Does that make sense? We got to think about that. If I've gone up X sub I, that means that X sub I has been launched off the back of the building. So that really doesn't work, does it? Uh, what I have to do is take this mass, because this once this guy's gone up, right, then all that's left is this chunk right here. Well, how much is that? That's 50 minus X sub I. See that trap? And I did that on purpose. I apologize, because I'm a mean guy, right? So let's see, 50, 150. And so what I'm going to end up with is I get 50 minus X sub I meters left. X sub I meters is off the back. There's 50 minus x sub i meters left, and that's the mass of the rope that I care about. The stuff off the back, I'm not fighting against it anymore. And now our meters cancel. All right, so this becomes 3 times 50 minus x sub i, which is 150, 150 minus 3 x sub i. Now, this, these are such cool problems. You ready? Here we go. How do I get from mass to force? Right? I've got the mass of the rope, but what's the force required for me to hold this rope x sub i uh, meters above where I started? Well, it's just 150 minus 3 x sub i. And I'm going to want to see all of this, and you're going to complain about it, but that's okay. We're all big boys and girls. All right? Now, how do I get from force to weight? Or wait, wait. How do I get from force, which is a weight, to work? Well, what did I say did the work? The delta x creates the work. So this just becomes 9.8 times 150 minus 3 x sub i times delta x. And then when I want the actual numerical value, that's easy. I just take the integral. The actual work done in lifting this thing 35 meters is the integral. Now, here's the question. Where's the action taking place from and to? Where on along this rope is this little bar sliding? Well, it started down here, and it's sliding up until it reaches how far? 35. So it's the integral from 0 to 35. Stick the 9.8 out in front because it's a constant, and I get 150 minus 3x. Don't forget your dx because delta x's turn into dx's when you take an integral. And it's that simple. Nothing to it. Start with the mass. Trust me. It'll make your life so much easier. Start with the mass. Work your way to force because that's easy and then do work. Now, let's say instead that this was a 50 foot pound, or excuse what? A 50 foot rope weighing 150 pounds. What's the only difference? Well, instead of starting at mass, because there isn't, well, there, <laughs> we're not going to talk about mass in the imperial system. They're called slugs. <laughs> Whatever the heck that means. You would start with F sub I, and the difference is we wouldn't have this 9.8. We would simply start with this guy times 50 minus X, minus X sub I. And I end up here. Okay? Um, I think that's going to be it for the, uh, for the lifting problems. Um, I'm going to take a little break, and I'll be back in a second, and we will talk about pumping problems on the next page. Okay, so what we got here is a, a cooking show pumping problem. And what we have is we got a cylindrical reservoir. It's filled with water. That's going to be important because if, if it's not filled with water, it's filled with something else, and we have to take density into account. And I'll show you why here in just a sec. What I want to do is figure out the total amount of work it takes to empty this reservoir. Okay. Now, what, this is tricky because density comes into play. So I can't use simple formulas like the Hooke's formula or just the force times distance. However, if you think about it, let's play around with our excuse me, let's play around with our formulas for a second. I know that force is equal to mass times acceleration. I also know that density is equal to mass per unit of volume. So I can rewrite this thing as mass. Well, if I solve for mass here, I get density times volume times the acceleration of gravity, right? Now, in this case, let's look at this problem again one more time. Think of this as a skim pump. We're not putting a straw in the bottom and then pumping everything out. That's a much simpler problem because nothing really changes. You're pumping the same amount of water from the bottom, so the same distance every time. However, if I put a skim pump, you know what a skim pump is, right? You throw it on the surface and it just 
from the top down, then the, then the amount of water is changing and the distance that I have to pump that little slice of action changes, right? As it moves down, I have to pump the water further up. Okay, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. But I, so what I want to look at is is this guy right here. All right, if I've got if I'm looking for f sub i, I've got density times acceleration. Those things never change. Times the volume of the ith slice of action. Now let's think about what that means for a sec. Think of this as I'm draining this thing. All right, I'm going to take my water, and I'm going to take a slice of Ripley action. It's going to be like a hockey puck, right? Looks like that. I'm going to take that slice and I'm going to have to pump that thing up x sub i units, right? You agree with that? Now, if this distance is x sub i, then this distance is delta x. I also know I've got a third, di hey, wait a sec, volume is in three dimensions, right? So I can use, um, this, this is where it's going to get a little bit strange. I can use the volume of this slice of action and then I pump it up x sub i units. So if I'm looking at the work sub i, I got density times the acceleration times the volume of the ith slice of action times the distance that I pump it, which in this case is density times acceleration times v sub i times x sub i. Now, let me go over that again. Whoops. Excuse me. Oh, sorry about that. Something went on here. <laughs> um, let's look. Let's take this apart one little piece at a time. We'll unpack this. Density of water doesn't change. We're good. Acceleration of gravity doesn't change. Volume of the ith slice. Well, let's look at this ith slice. I'm going to pull it out. So the ith slice is a little tiny cylinder, isn't it? I know that it's delta x thick. I know that its radius is four meters. Right? This should be delta x, by the way. So I know, well, what's the volume of a cylinder? Well, it's pi r squared times the height. So the v sub i, in this case, is pi times 16, that's 4 squared, times delta x. Or another way to write this is 16 pi delta x. Now, notice that delta x's role has changed. Instead of delta x making the work like it did in the other problem, it is now making the volume, which begs the question, well, Ripley, what makes the work? Well, we just talked about it. It's this x sub i. So in this case, I'm going to start putting numbers in. We know that the density of water is 1,000. Let's make sure our units match up. We know that this is kilograms per cubic meter, right? I know that the acceleration of gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared. My, remember, my, my units had better be kilogram meter squared per second squared. All right, so I've got a kilogram, I've got a meter, I need some more stuff in here. That's my volume. And then my x sub i is another meter, right? So let's see, volume, 9.8, oh, what am I doing? Is another, I'm getting all crazy, 9.8, oh, wow, I just spazzed out. Let's try this again. I completely missed my v sub i. So 16 pi, kilo, what are you doing, Ripley? My lord, 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed. <laughs> oh, not every day is a great day. My V sub I is going to be, that's where I was getting all crazy, 16 pi. What? What are the units on it? Well, it's got to be meters cubed, which is kind of nice because those go away. And then my X sub I is going to be X sub I meters. Oh, you know what? I got a little bit lazy in there. I'm having a hard time today. Let's, let me put this in black so we make sure we don't miss it. This is 16 pi times delta x meters cubed. So I end up with kilogram meters squared per second squared, which is effectively known as joules. All right, cool. All right, so the trick here, really important. The trick is this v sub i that I'm talking about is the volume of the slice of action. So again, that delta x helps create that volume of this slice of action. The distance in this case that remember for, uh, force times distance, the distance is created by the x sub i. That can be a little bit confusing when you go from a lifting problem or a, um, uh, uh, good lord, my words have gone away, or a spring problem to a pumping problem. Okay, so let's actually set this thing up. The overall work, all right, I know that I'm going to have 9,800. 
I'm going to have an integral here. Um, might as well pull the 16 pi out too, right? Well, 9800 times 16 pi. And then watch how pretty this is. That delta x becomes a dx, and the only thing left is an x dx, which is crazy. Now, what are the limits? Where is the action taking place from and to? Think about it this way. All right, I got a little skim pump here. I'll pull a wheel, maybe I'll go, I don't know what that is. And I drop it in. As it's falling, is the skim pump doing any work? And the answer is no. It has to fall how far? Well, three meters before it does any work. As soon as it splat hits the, the top of the water and starts pumping, it has fallen three meters, but it's done no work. However, that said, it has to pump the water a slice of action up on the top. That thing's got to go up three meters. The next one's got to go up, say, 3.0001 meters, et cetera, et cetera. And then we just add all those up. The way we add them up is an integral. So again, where is the action taking place from and to? It takes place from three meters. And then how far down does it have to go? Well, it starts at three, and it's got to go seven meters deep. So it stops at 10. Now notice, setup, Ugh, ugly. Ah! However, integral, oh, smiles, frowns. All right, now I am going to do one that's, diff that's slightly different, because you might be looking at this and be like, this is, really, this is easy. What are you talking about? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a conical reservoir this time. And we'll do, we'll, let's use exactly the same measurements. This is going to be 10 meters. It's going to be 10 meters high. high that's its altitude. It's going to be 8 meters across. Okay? It's full. All right? We're gonna, here's what we're going to do. It's full of water. So, you, ooh, you know what I'm going to use? No, I don't want to use that. I want to use this. <laughs> Just because, oh, I think it's this. Yeah, it's, oh, look at that. It's full of water. Oh, I wish I had a different color. Let's change the color. I'm sorry, you guys. I'm being obnoxious. Okay. Yeah, it's full of water. <laughs> I, want to, I want to empty it so that there's only two meters of water left. So when I'm done, whoops, when I'm done, I should probably go back to my original thingy dingy. When I'm done, there's only going to be two meters of water left in the reservoir. This is two meters. Okay? Now, I'm definitely going to have to change colors or we're not going to be able to see anything. Think about it this way. The whole thing is full. What I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a slice of action. I'm going to make said slice of action x sub i meters deep. Remember, this thing started full. We drop a skim pump in it and we start pulling. I guess if this thing were a vacuum, it'd kind of be like we were sucking all the water out of the top of it. We just have to have a big pump at the top. We start with the water at the top. As it works its way down, the pump would suck that water up. That's another way to think about it. If this is x sub i, this is delta x. This, however, this is where things start getting a little crazy. This distance is changing, right? As this slice of action gets lower, that radius of that little of that little slice of action is going to be bigger so it's changing so i'm going to call this r sub i and we're going to have to deal with that which is unfortunate now th there's an important question that needs to be asked here students will often say well ripley why can you use a cylinder here why aren't you using a frustrum? A frustrum is, refers to a part of a cone. Well, the reason is the same reason that I can use, remember back with integrals, when I had a function, uh, doing this, I can use rectangles, right? Rectangles are the most convenient thing because at the end of the day, what do we do? We stack an infinite number of infinitely thin rectangles together and we get the area. Same thing here. I get to use cylinders because, think of that, when I take the integral, the, the thickness of these shrink to a disk. All right, I no longer have a cylinder, I have a disk. Okay, so let's start with our W sub i. Now I am going to tell you, when you do this work, I'm going to need to see this. I'm gonna to wanna to see the W sub i for you to receive full credit. All right, so here we go. We got density, acceleration of gravity, volume of the thingy dingy, and then the distance that we pump it. Density, accelerate, volume, then this x sub i. Okay, so here we go. Density of water is 1,000. Acceleration of gravity is 9.8. Okay, now the volume is going to be a little tricky because it changes. However, if you look, I mean, think about this. If I drop x sub i, if I do this right here, and I know that that distance is x sub i, hey, I've got similar figures, don't I? I know that little r, so I know r sub i, is to little altitude, which is x sub i, as Big R, which is 4, right, is to big altitude. Let me do that for you again. All right, let me, I'll do it in a different color. All right, little r is to x sub i as big R 
is to 10. A big R is 4 is to 10. Let me go back to orange, even though it's obnoxious, as 4 is to 10. So in a puff of algebra, that implies that R sub i is equal to 2 fifths x sub i. Now, why is that important? Well, because I need the whole thing to be in terms of x, because I'm going to have a dx when everything is said and done. Once I know that r sub i is 2 fifths x sub i, well, I, I know that the volume v sub i is going to be pi times 2 fifths x sub i squared times delta x, right? Pi r squared is the area of the circle, delta x is the thickness of the cylinder, and poof, I'm done. So this guy appears to be, what, 4 pi 20 fifths, 4 pi 20 fifths x sub i squared delta x. So let's put that in here. 4 pi 20 fifths x. Oh crap, I just put water everywhere, everywhere. I'm going to have to come back here. I'll, I'll see you guys. Cat, that's pretty funny. We're talking about pumping water and I just spilled a bunch of water on myself. Huh? All right, so anyway, where were we? So where are we? 4 pi 20 fifths x sub i squared times delta x. And then how's the work created? Well, I pump this slice of action up x sub i. So then I've got another x sub i. Isn't that nice? That's pretty slick. OK, so the overall work. Now, what did I say? I want to empty this until there's two meters left. Well, I get 98. I kind of pinched myself in here, didn't I? 9,800 times 4 pi 20 fifths. 25ths times the integral from where to where. Well, I start pumping zero meters, don't I? So I started zero because this thing was full. Unlike the cylinder over here, this was not full. So I had to start pumping three meters down. Not this guy. I start pumping immediately from zero. And how far do I go? Well, it's 10 meters deep. I need two meters at the end. So I go from zero to eight, right? Because I got to go eight meters down. And then what do I get? Just x cubed dx. Piece of cake, right? There's nothing to it. All right, everybody. I hope that was helpful. Um, I think this stuff can be tricky. We're, I think we spent a couple of days on this, so you don't have to worry about it too much. Um, again, I want what I do want to emphasize is the setup is the tricky part. The actual integral itself is always a piece of cake. All right? Um, I think that's it. Enjoy. Thanks for listening. I'll see you tomorrow. We'll do some mathematics. Bye-bye.